Hi, I'm Cliff Lansley, and I'm going to be taking you on this video uh, through what we use for body language when we're analysing videos. It's called the SCANS model, and we're going to be using a clip from a real-life case, a criminal case, to show you how we actually analyse uh, those clips. So first of all, let me take you through the SCANS model. Now, SCANS stands for the Six Channel Analysis Model. And uh, that is because it's rooted on the six communication channels. So we don't just rely on face, we don't just rely on body, we don't just rely on the words that people use, uh, because those are not reliable. What we need to do is cluster them together to corroborate the information we get from the videos. So you'll see on this model that we've got some um, content at the top. It doesn't mean it's more important. What this is, is what we usually default to in conversation. So we'll hear people speaking and, uh, no, that's not what I said. Uh, but what you said usually is, isn't as important as how you say it. That's the interactional style. And then the voice. What's your tone of voice? What's your volume? What's your pitch? Uh, we're interested in seeing how those change from your normal pitch and tone when you're in this situation with us. And then what about your face? What is your face doing while you're speaking? Because that can leak information about what you're thinking and feeling, often below your own consciousness. And then there's body language. So I'm separating body from face and psychophysiology, which comes next, because body is the movements of the big pieces of your body, like your head and your shoulders and your arms and your legs, that happen uh, during an interaction. And then we move to psychophysiology, and uh, this is a long word to describe what's going on inside the body. And normally you need medical equipment to measure that. Uh, but what we've learned and what research tells us is there are certain indicators that tell us what's happening with your digestive system with your autonomic nervous system uh, and with the chemicals and the electrical impulses that are going around your body when you're uh, suffering an emotion or enjoying an emotion. So these six channels are valuable if you look at them holistically and that's core to the scanner model. So this is the scans model of deception and at the core of this you'll see the six channels and at the top you've got emotion and cognition. That's what people are thinking and feeling because that can ooze out and leak from one or more of the channels. And if there's an inconsistency between what the person is saying and one of those channels, uh, then we call that a pin, a point of interest, unless it can be explained by the story, which we call the account, the habits and ticks of the person that we call baseline or the context. And that's the micro context of this interview or conversation, or it's the macro context of the cultural differences and what's gone before and what's coming after and the stakes for the individual. Let's define the PIN because it's important. Uh, the PIN stands for point of interest. And we would define that as a behavioral indicator from one of the six communication channels that is inconsistent with the account, the baseline or the context. So before you get too excited with a pin, uh, there's no single indicator of deception. So one pin isn't good enough. We pay no heed to one pin because it happens all the time when people are telling the truth. If you get two pins, uh, don't get excited, push it aside. Uh, because evidence uh, from the research tells us that that's not enough to make a judgment on veracity, which is truth and lie decisions. But if you get three pins, across two channels, two or more channels, within seven seconds from a stimulus, then the research tells us, and our practice tells us, that you can be highly confident that deception is at play. So that's the scanner model and the algorithm, that's the theory. Now, what about the practice? Uh, well, we're going there now. So let's take you into a case, which is Ian Huntley, he's a school caretaker. And this is from a police interview back in 2002, 20 years ago, and he's under arrest in a police station being interviewed in connection with the disappearance of Holly and Jessica. So this is a short clip, I'm gonna play it now. It's only 11 seconds. So pay attention by listening and watching the behavior of Ian Huntley and his interaction with the police officer. Are you ready? Here we go. Any of this, Ian, was there any occasion that you actually came into contact, physical contact with the girls? Physical contact? Mm. So did you catch anything? Uh, I guess you uh, found a, a few points there, but let me take you through this and I'm going to chunk it into a, a few bits here uh, because uh, what I'm going to do is do it slow motion. So if you see here, we've got a, a timer on the bottom going to 11 seconds. So this first half of the video, if I scrub through this, we've got that stuff going on at the beginning where a little bit of uh, rapid blinking where he's thinking and the licking of the lips 
and the swallow while his mouth comes together. That's showing anxiety, but that can be explained by the interview. It can be explained by him maybe fearful of being disbelieved, uh, or he could be fearful of being caught in a lie. So let's just put that to one side uh, because the meaning point of the question hasn't happened yet. So the police officer started speaking, but where she's going is about, did you have physical contact with the two girls? Because if you did, um, I'm now putting you at the place or the scene of the crime. And that's her tactic. And uh, that he had a connection. Last person to see them alive is admitted to that. So let's go there. A great tactical question. So she's moved in here. And after that initial anxiety, as she moves into the trigger, which is the meaning point of the question, let's watch his body language. So he shifts around in the chair. Uh, let's not make too much of that, but now we get some tension as he moves back. The tension as he leans back in the chair and crosses his arms in front of him. So that tension is probably to do with not leaking information. And we tend to tense up so we don't leak because we know there's a lot of body language training that police officers go through and we don't want to leak anything from our body. So we clamp up. Sadly, that clamping up or muscle tension is an indicator of deception because it's seen so often when people are telling lies. And so research tells us that's important. It's only one pin. You can't rely on it on its, on its own because there could be other reasons. But that clamping is important. What you'll also notice, he's, not, he's just started to open his mouth, so we're not going into his answer yet, but he's, he's leaning back and he's clamping in front of him. But if you watch him, as soon as he clamps, you also see this little movement of his thumb. Watch his hand on his forearm. He's now manipulating up and down his forearm. So manipulation is almost like a, a countermeasure to stress and anxiety. So if he's fearful of being caught in a lie, he's trying to relieve that stress by manipulating his arm. And some people do this all the time, baseline. But here, he's, we've watched the whole video, this is not something Huntley does. So it's a change from his baseline. So an increase in manipulators or a decrease is a point of interest, as well as the muscle tension as well as the gestural retreat. So we've got some indicators starting to cluster now, and he's only just opened his, his lips have just parted. He's only just moving into his response. So as we move into his response, if you remember, he repeats the question back and says, uh, physical contact? No. And while he's saying that, what we get is the continuation of the manipulators, but we get a single-sided shoulder shrug. If you watch his right shoulder, it increases about one centimetre up and down. And it carries with it the elbow. So you see the elbow moving up, but he's not moving his elbow, it's his shoulder that's moving the arm here. So the shoulder movement is leakage because to its full extent, this means I have no confidence in what I'm saying. I'm disconnected from my words. But when it leaks below consciousness, that gestural slip is a pin. Uh, because he's, it's highly likely that he's not conscious that he's leaking that information, that he's not connected to his, his response. So here, while he's answering, let's combine that with what he's saying. So I'll run this at full speed so you can hear the words now. Have a listen. So we're now overlaying the voice and the interactive style, the way he's speaking, because he's repeating the question back. He's having to think hard to construct an answer and therefore he's buying time by repeating the question back when the question was clear. And he says no, but the volume of no drops 50%. And this is a good indication of deception because it happens so often when people are being deceptive because they don't connect themselves to lies. They know they're bad. And they distance themselves from the lies with this subconscious dropping of a volume. Now, dropping of a volume could also mean they're unsure or they're sad. But in this case, when you cluster it with the other indicators, it gives us confidence that deception is at play. And when deception is at play, you've got to try and convince the officers, uh, because when you're telling the truth, you just convey your story. But if you have to try and convince, that's an indicator of deception. And then he also follows with five head shakes. Now, a head shake when you say no is natural. Uh, be, be aware of cultural differences here. But this is England. This is Soham in uh, the UK. And this means no in the UK, and this means yes. 
So uh, what he's doing is he's saying no, and we would normally say no. Uh, physical contact, no. Uh, but we're seeing the word no, volume dropped, and then this convinced tactic where he's going like this five times afterwards. So he's trying to convince the officer that I didn't do it. So taking a loan, be careful. But when you cluster those together, what we get is a cluster of eight indicators within seven seconds across three channels. So let's look at that analysis in one diagram. Here it is. So what we've got from the left to right is the timeline. And uh, on the bottom, you'll see we've got this uh, one, two, three, four. These are the seconds, uh, the counters on the video. It's an 11 second video. We're ignoring the lip lick and the swallow and the blink rate increase because it happened before there was any significant trigger. It's just the police officer talking. But as soon as we got the meaning point of the question, which I've put here round about second four, uh, which was when she said, uh, throughout any of this, uh, when you actually came into contact, so physical contact, uh, this is, Huntley knows where she's going here. And that's where we're gonna get reactions, maybe subconscious, to the question. So that's where the clock starts. So we've got to tune in, even while the question's being asked, not while the person's answering. So from second four, we saw the body back. We saw the increase in manipulators, if you remember, the little stroking on the arm. Uh, he repeated the question back, and we got this single-sided micro shoulder shrug. When he said no, the volume dropped 50%, and there's a little eye closure there as well. Eye closure is something longer than one twentieth of a second. It was actually about a quarter of a second. He's blocking himself off from his answer. Volume drop, blocking off. And then we've got the body tension in terms of the clamping again. He's still hold, holding on to his arm. And then we get the convince of the head shake no that's out of sync with the answer. So when there's a disconnect between the body and the words, well, that tells us they're trying to convince us or there's deception at play. So let's give you an opportunity to pull all that together and watch it one more time. Here we go. Any of this, Ian, was there any occasion that you actually came into contact, physical contact, with the girls? Physical contact. Mm. So you've seen the analysis, you've seen a summary in a diagram. However, in a forensic context, we have to go one stage further and we have to produce a report. So the report looks something like this. And uh, this documents the time frame, uh, the things we've seen and heard, the scans code. We've got 144 of these from the 27 pins, the coding system, uh, so we can reference it back. We've got the, uh, what people say and then our considerations, what are the hypotheses and where do you need to go next? with the questions or the investigation. And this is needed to help the client, but also for due diligence, because if we're ever pushed on full disclosure of saying, hang on a minute, I'm gonna sue you for what you said. Where did that judgment come from? Uh, we can evidence our analysis. So thanks for joining us. Uh, please let us have your feedback and comments and uh, give us a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And if you like it, please let us know, then we can continue this type of stuff. Uh, if you subscribe, then you'll get to hear as we release a series of high stake videos uh, on a weekly basis. And so you can see this applied in context with many, many more cases.